Carly, while you're getting your audio started, um, why don't we jump in and have our speakers introduce themselves? Um, just maybe while we get, get your audio back up and running, I'm sure everyone is eager to hear from, from our guest speakers. Uh, Damon, let's start with you. Why don't you uh, kick us off and, and tell everyone here a little bit about yourself and, and why we're excited to hear from you today. <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. My name is Damon Lemby. Nice to see everybody. I'm the CEO of Learn It, and I'm super excited to be here. I think we're going to have a great panel today. Uh, I've been, we've been talking amongst the four of ourselves for the last 20 minutes, and there's some pretty great inspirational stories. Anyways, uh, I've been with Learn It from the very beginning, uh, 26 years prior to that. I grew up playing sports my whole life and played baseball at Arizona State. I was drafted twice, uh, once by Atlanta Braves, once by the New York Yankees. Um, that didn't work out. Everything happens for the best. Uh, one of those things was I became best friends with a gentleman on the panel today, Jacob Cruz, who's awesome. And, um, you know, I learned a lot from sports, and we'll talk a little bit about more uh, that later. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Valletta, who's a star new instructor for Learn It. Valletta, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much, Damon. Yes, as Damon said, my name is Valletta Burgess. I am a brand new instructor here at Learn It. Very excited to be working with these guys. I am a track and field athlete. I've been running since oh, as far back as I could remember, but I started running for a team when I was 12 years old. And from there, I ran all through high school. I was a, uh, I made uh, about two or three state championship appearances, I think two in high school, um, went off to college, uh, did played sports there. Then um, I came to grad school. I worked for a little bit and then I um, started running post-collegiately, trained uh, in my hometown of Myrtle Beach. I trained for a club there, Myrtle Beach Track and Field Club, formerly, formerly known and now it's uh, a different name. I think it's called Beach Striders. So shout out to my coach there. I, came, I moved to Columbia, South Carolina, started training with a professional coach, um, started uh, graduate school last year um, during the pandemic. Uh, but in that time that I've been working with my coach, Anthony Washington, I've become the 2019 Master National Champion, 800 meters, the 2019 Regional World Champion in the 800, 2021 AAC Conference Champion 4x4, 2021 NCCAA Relay All-American on the 4x4. And um, I'm just continuing to compete. I'm also a graduate assistant for the Columbia International University Track and Field Program. Uh, I work primarily with the women's team, the long sprints, 400 meters, and the 4x4 relay. So I'm super excited to be here with all of you and I'm excited to, to have a good discussion. Thank you. How about you, uh, Mr. Cruz? Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Cruz. I am originally from Southern California, make my home in Arizona where I met Damon here at, uh, or there at Arizona State. I have been in sports and baseball my whole life. You know, I just recently had somebody ask me, uh, what was plan B, you know, growing up? And to be honest with me and my family, there was never a plan B. It was going to be sports. It was going to be baseball. So I'm very fortunate because I, I did not have a backup plan. Uh, got drafted by San Francisco, played nine years in the big leagues with Colorado, Detroit, Cincinnati, Cleveland, uh, a little bit with uh, San Francisco. Got to meet Barry Bonds, very unique experience. Um had uh, Ken Griffey Jr. as my best man in my wedding at one point. So uh, these uh, little tidbits uh, throughout my life have been really cool to meet some really amazing uh, baseball players. Um, moved into coaching in 2011. My goal was to get back as a major league coach. It took about eight years to do that. It took longer for me to get a, to the big leagues as a coach than it did as a, as a ball player, where I've met a ton of incredible people along the way. Um, and just realize how hard and how different it is from being the player uh, to transitioning into coaching where it's really a selfless job. You know, you care about the guys and then you care about them. Uh, currently I am coaching with the Milwaukee Brewers where we are in first place, five games ahead of everybody else. I've done that for two years before that I was a Pittsburgh Pirates coach where we weren't in first place. <laughs> we were in last. So um, 
and here I am excited to answer any questions, be a part of this panel, meeting some great people, um, and just really, really excited about this. Thank you, Jacob. Um, now to Casey. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I So for, for me, I'm, I'm 25 years old. I am from San Diego, so another SoCal native, um, but I actually live in New York City and have for about two and a half years now. Um, my athletic background, I played volleyball for about 10 years from middle school on to uh, collegiate athletics. I played two years at Montana State, one at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Um, and then after three years, I closed the door of um, collegiate athletics after a season ending injury and um, I graduated in 2018. Fun fact, I was one of the shortest people in the in Division One NCAA volleyball at five foot two. So that's a proud accomplishment of mine that yes. I did not like, I guess I technically earned, but my uh, spoiler alert, it wasn't because of my skill. My position's the short one in the back row. It's called Libero. So um, during another another kind of unique part of my collegiate ex experience that isn't necessarily related to athletics, but I think a lot of the skills I, I took through it were, were definitely. Um, my senior year of college, I decided to finish through Penn State's World Campus, which is um, a completely online program. I just wanted to finish my degree after a couple of transfers. And I took that opportunity to actually travel the world for a year um, because I was location independent, which was super unique before COVID. Now everybody obviously does it and everything's location independent. Um, but that was a great adventure. And I'm really grateful I did that because it taught me things that I couldn't have learned in the classroom. Um, and then... 2018, I graduated, moved to New York City for just on a whim for a job, a, you know, a sal or a, an hourly job in tech sales. Um, and it ultimately led me to my job now, uh, which is at Google. And then in October of 2020, I was faced with a new and very unexpected chapter of my life, um, which is a rare stage four cancer. And I was talking to the panel about this earlier, but i um, I'm just, I'm so excited to be here because I think so much of my journey from athletics onto travel and to, you know, this fight of my life, um, I, I, th I feel like athletics has really equipped me for it. Um, my good news to share is that my last scans, which were about a month ago, showed no evidence of disease. So that's been celebrated um, and a very welcome celebration, especially after 10 months of chemotherapy. So I'm almost done. I'm enrolled in a clinical trial that will start in a month and a half. It's at UCSD and it'll be pretty novel. So lots to look forward to, excited for a, you know, a really long full life. So that's my story. That's incredible. Casey, we are so grateful that you're here. Thank you so much. Um, your contribution to this conversation is gonna be just so exciting. Um, so you. thank you all four of you for introducing yourself and thank you everyone who's joined. Um, just a really quick overview of those of you who know Learn It, who know the offsite community. We're so grateful for you guys to have joined us again. Those of you who are new, welcome. Uh, these are really exciting panels and, and uh, conversations and sometimes just FAQs that we get to cover uh, every Friday hosted by Carly who runs our entire program. Um, so thank you everyone for being here today. I think that everyone here can agree, especially those who obviously made the effort to join us today that an athlete's mindset is so prevalent in good business. It just is. So having these four folks here to just pepper with questions <laughs> and talk about their experiences and how that shaped them as both personal and professional uh, people it is going to be really exciting. Uh, so for those of you that are with us um, as guests here today, the plan is we have some pre-baked questions that we've received from people that were inquiring. We have some questions that came from our team and from those on offsite. So we're going to start with some questions and I'm just going to uh, start peppering the panel with those questions and let them answer. As it happens, feel free to throw in the chat additional questions. Maybe you're looking for more information. We're gonna make sure to come back to those and get as many of those questions answered. Uh, so feel free to start making notes of what those look like at this point. Um, so let's just dive in unless anybody has any major thoughts. Um, I have uh, questions for every single person here. So I'm gonna start with Valletta. Uh, Valletta, can you tell us a little bit about how your experience as an athlete plays specifically into your facilitation style um, and, and how you teach people professional development skills here at Learn It and, and anywhere else you found yourself as a facilitator, but specifically tying in things you've learned as an athlete to, to the way that you deliver? Um, okay, well, thank you so much for the question. 
basically, I, when I am asked to teach a course, um, I try to definitely lean upon my experiences as an athlete and also as a, a soldier in the Army National Guard, because I've had, what I've learned is all of those experiences tie into so many things um, that are specific to the boardroom, you know, emotional control, time management, um, learning how to uh, work with difficult people. All of those things are very pertinent to how you kind of conduct yourself, your reputation. Those things are very, very important. And I, I guess like whenever I have a course, I, I find a way, I sit down and say, okay, what have I experienced based upon my own experiences that takes a, a broad understanding um, of what I'm trying to convey to people? So I take it from a broad scope and then I hone it in for my experiences. And the first thing I think is, okay, what do I want them to know? What is the basic overall reaching point? And then I just kind of go from there. So that's really where my style comes from. I hope that that made sense. <laughs> Certainly did to me. Um, it, again, for anyone who uh, has any, any additional questions, feel free to, to pop them in there. Um, I did see one question that's looking for the purpose. And, and just to kind of recap that, uh, you know, at Learn It, we'd like in our offsite meetings to be able to provide value to our community. And one of the values is, is understanding the mindset of uh, professionals and how so many of us have these skills as athletes. Even if it was someone like me, I played volleyball a few years in, in high school and that was it. And that was kind of the end of my athletic professional career. But I often tie back things things in my professional and personal life that pull from that. So I'm hoping that when we ask people like Damon and Jacob and Casey and Valletta, all these ways that they do it, who've had much more robust athletic careers, it allows us as professionals to then draw on our own experiences as minor as they might be. And yes, I feel like seventh grade soccer will count here. So if you can pull on those skills, oh, that'll help. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember those days well. Um, well, good then, uh, Valetta, I'll give you a break and, and pivot over to Casey. And Casey, put you on the spot again. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you and your sister to start the reroute? And can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. So um, after I was diagnosed, I actually, the whole shtick is that I, we had this really dramatic moment um, where I'd, I just had fertility preservation surgery and surgery to place a catheter in my chest. Um, and I was taking my first shower after four days and the water hit my hair, my then hair, which I clearly don't have much of anymore. Um, and I was struck with this clarity that although obviously dealing with cancer at 25 is a really, really unique experience. Um, it wasn't the first time that I'd felt kind of the state of suspension between who I was and who I was about to be. Um, so I guess you could say it was an identity crisis of sorts, but I realized that I felt the same during, you know, when I closed the chapter of athletics, that was a huge, uh, you know, source of my identity. Um, I felt the same way after a horrible breakup um, and a huge transition and a big move to a new city. So we, I was talking about all of these feelings to my sister who was helping me shower because I, I couldn't move too well, but she, she and I came to this conclusion that reroutes and detours in life, they're very, very universal. We don't really talk about them a lot. We talk about them from the other side once we've already overcome, you know, the obstacle, um, but what power there might be in exploring that space between that really isn't discussed much. Um, so we started, our podcast is born, it's called The Reroute by Good Humans Only. Um, and basically we interview people who we look up to um, and we talk about, hey, like what's the, what's one of the events that shifted the trajectory of your life? Uh, how did it shift your trajectory? Or how, like, what, what did you learn from it? How did your perspective change? Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of the genesis of the reroute. For me personally, it's just been a really fun passion project amidst a lot of downtime. Like I said earlier, I work for Google, but I've, I've been on medical leave for eight months now. Um, so I do have a lot of downtime and it's been really fun to dive into this project and invest myself in something that I've been really passionate about. Thanks, Casey. That that is that's uh, definitely an impressive passion to to carry on outside of sports. And I 
Rachel, I don't mean to put you on the spot who contributed here, uh, but just just to add your thought, you you mentioned that you kind of struggle finding, you know, focus and effort when your passion for sports has ended, when maybe that part of your life is has come to an end. And if coaching isn't organic for you, you know, how do you leverage a passion for something that's not there? And how do you put that into play outside of it? So how do you put it into a professional career that maybe is in front of a desk, in front of a computer, um, if just coaching isn't, isn't really your thing? Um, so I, I'd like to, you know, just, just take a step from from our pre-selected uh, questions and maybe push that to the the board here. What do you guys recommend? I know Jacob, you're you're in coaching. Damon, you aren't necessarily a direct trainer, but you do run a training company. You know, Valette, I know you're in training. Casey, you know, to maybe you guys can help with Rachel and anyone else with the same struggle. How do you leverage a passion for something that that? something is gone and turn that into something tangible for, for a brand new job or career that maybe isn't directly coaching. Anyone want to take that from the panel? I'll, I'll go if I just kind of give everyone else an opportunity to think about it, but I'll just say really briefly, I think that it's, it's when you see athletics as more than just uh, performance on a field or performance on the court or on the, you know, or wherever, um, or on the track. When you see the true value of athletics, I mean, when you understand, you know, athletics is all about how you take ownership of who you are and the, and the athlete that you want to become. And when you learn that and you become um, and you build that understanding that, you know, this is so much bigger than just what it is that I do. And I am so much more than just who I am as an athlete. I think that's when you start to understand that, Hey, I can parlay this passion into other things. It just doesn't have to be that sport. It, It doesn't have to be this being a part of this sport. I think we, we come into that, especially when athletes, you know, in my sport, track and field, you know, everybody wants to go to the Olympics and everybody doesn't get there. So you're constantly talking to people and they, they feel like, okay, if I don't make a team, if I don't make the Olympic team, then I failed. Well, no, not really, because you now have something that you can, that you, you went towards a goal. You, you learn how to um, discipline yourself. That takes a lot of self-discipline to even try and have a legitimate shot at that. So all of those things are valuable and what you learn through that. I mean, there's there's tons of lessons in just the, the journey of getting there, whether you get there or not. So, yeah. Well, yeah excellent like insight. Oh, go ahead, Jacob, please. I'd like to add on that. You know, I, I'm still in the coaching industry, but... Uh, you know, I'm looking to transition here shortly. Uh, I've talked about it just with being with my family a little bit more. And I've asked myself that same question, like, how, how am I going to handle being behind the desk? You know, how am I going to be handle like feeling trapped? Because all my life I've been outside, outdoors. Um, and it's really going to test your character of who you are and what you believe in, right? Uh, but I've always been a person to have goals and create goals, uh, create challenges for myself. So as I'm looking to transition into this uh, uh, new sector, uh, I'm telling myself like, nothing's going to change. I- I'm gonna create challenges within, my, within myself, within my work, whatever that might be. I'm gonna create goals and I'm gonna see how I can attain those goals uh, because that's the, always been my mindset through baseball and in sports. I don't think that's going to change as I transition into the business world. That's excellent insight. And, you know, I, that's what I was really excited to hear about from, from the four of you. Um, and Damon, I'm about to put you on the spot so you can prepare. Because, uh, you know, when, you, when it comes to the concept of athlete, af- athletes, obviously, one of the things that, that comes to mind is discipline, right? Extremely good discipline. You have goals, you have daily intentions. And when you're, you know, collegiate and above in, in, in any sort of athletic uh, space, you're going to have a lot of great discipline. So that's a really strong muscle that obviously translates to any walk of life, um, you know, parenting or, or business, anything that, that those skills are inherent in you, um, that, 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 that basic structure of habit comes in play. Um, 
So Damon, uh, can you maybe talk about some of those disciplines that, that you learned when you were being drafted for the Yankees <laughs> um, and, and transfer those to how you run your business and how you use those daily disciplines and how you use those expectations of, of intention and goal in, in a business setting? Thank you, Courtney. And I'd like to give a shout out to Courtney for jumping in today, um, <laughs> stepping up and, you know, things don't always go perfect. And that's one of the things you learn from sports and you deal with adversity and she jumped in like a, a, a pro. So thank you, Courtney. And uh, to answer your question, I like to tell people that um, as far as my leadership ability skills, the vast majority of what I've learned over the years has come from sports. It's come from playing and it's, it's also come from being around some of the greatest, I, I feel grateful and fortunate. I played for three of the greatest college coaches, uh, Andy Lopez at Pepperdine. And then I left for a year to a junior college and um, played for John Nochi, one of the winningest college coaches in history. And then to Arizona state uh, with Jim Brock, who's a legendary coach who taught us courage um, dealing with uh, the final stages of his cancer. And he was there on the field with us to the very end, um, Coach Brock. And I also played for some pretty poor coaches and I don't need to name anything, name anyone, but what, what, he did, what I was able to do is I was able to learn from, from all of them. And if I had to distill down the top three mindsets uh, that I learned was, I would say grit, how to handle failure, and, and dealing with the imposter syndrome, you know, there, th those were something that, that came up. Um, the imposter syndrome is, you know, when I went to Arizona state, you know, I, uh, I, I looked at, this is, you know, before the internet, but you know, the names of Jacob Cruz and Anton Williamson and these guys, these guys were like celebrities to me. And uh, so it wasn't sure if I was going to fit in or not, but to overcome that I used grit, you know, passion, you know, and I just worked harder than anybody else and um, was able to make my way uh, and, and be part of that team, which was one of the greatest accomplishments I, I ever had. And I don't think I would have been able to do that uh, without, um, you know, putting in the effort. And, you know, in sports, as in uh, work, whether you're inter interviewing for jobs or, you know, you lose a deal, uh, there's a lot of failure. I mean, Jacob will know, tell you, and, you know, in, in baseball, if you fail 70% of the time as a hitter, you're, you're a multimillionaire, you know, and it's, and it's, and it's, I used all those that I've learned and, uh, and, and really have uh, leveraged my um, past experience in sports, which has been just um, so great. I mean, I, and yeah, that's, that's kind of like my whole experience coming in to learn it was, uh, don't get me wrong, I've had some great mentors and some great business people like my father that I've been around, but uh, playing and building a community of friends and sports and uh, the bond, like we talked about pre-event, uh, you know, you just, you build a bond with other athletes and it, it's something that I'm just grateful for that I've, I've carried, carried on. So it's been great. That's excellent. And, and I feel like you, you know, you talk about the, those leadership qualities, you know, I think anyone who's ever worked for uh, a, a, a boss and, or those who have been athletes that have a coach that they work closely with, can I always pick out those, those key um, qualities that make them good and make you want to continue to work with them. So I actually would love to go around. Um, I'll start with Casey, Valletta, Damon, then Jacob, uh, and I'll start um, by kicking it off. You can tell me about maybe a coach you've had that you think that just absolutely um, knew what they were doing and made you want to work with them. Um, when I was, uh, when I was in volleyball in high school, my coach, she was phenomenal. Everyone loved her. And one of the things Damon kind of hit on was, you know, talking about failure and how, uh, it's just part of the process. You, you can't win every time. Um, you know, unless your name's Simone. Uh, but other than that, you know, the ability to <laughs> the ability to understand failure and accept it and move on. Uh, her favorite saying was at the end of a loss, if we had a game that we lost, she said, we can be disappointed tomorrow. Let's focus on what we can do better today. And it was the most calming mantra. And she said it every time we lost, we weren't that good. We probably only won 50% of the time, but it made me want to continue to work to get better. Uh, so that was something that stuck with me. And any colleague I've ever worked with that had a failure made a 
made a mistake, didn't win a deal, something went wrong, we can be disappointed tomorrow. Let's focus on what we can do better today. So that's something that came from my athletic background. So uh, I'd love to go around in the order. I think, Casey, we were starting with you. If you can, uh, if I can put you on the spot mm-hmm. and tell, talk about a coach you've had and a leadership skill that kind of stuck with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was my, I've had, I've had many, many good coaches, like, like Damon was saying, some good coaches, some pretty horrible ones too. And I do think the bad ones teach you just as much as the good ones. If maybe if you do end up wanting to go into coaching or even your professional career, you know, Hey, these are the traits that I don't want to exhibit. (laughs) So you do learn from them. Um, but for me, I'd say my club coach, he, he was just amazing. He's still one of my very, very, he's very, very near and dear to my heart. Um, he taught us how to be elastic. So Courtney, kind of to your point, like you'd always say, be elastic, be elastic, bounce back. If we, if you make a, an unforced error, which was very common in my position, cause I was the one receiving serves a lot and it's a very mental game. It's, very, it's pretty slow paced sometimes. So there's a lot of room for error. Um, you, you need to bounce back. You need to, you know, dig deep and find it within yourself to get to the next ball. If you didn't get the one before and you need to forget, you need to have short-term memory. You need to um, focus on the the greater picture and something else that he really, really pushed was this idea of family. Um, it was just that my, my club team, we just became so tight knit and he, he would always say that we're a family. And, and to this day, they, they feel like that, especially, you know, going through what I'm going through, they've shown up in ways that I couldn't even imagine. And these are people, you know, I'm 25 now, like I haven't, I haven't spoken with regularly for about eight years. Um, so I would say those are the two things that my best coach ever taught me to be elastic and to um, allow, I guess, friends and people to become family, even if they're not necessarily related to you. All right. Is it my turn? It is. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Um, kind of uh, to really jump off of what Casey so eloquently said, um, I had a coach, um, my first club coach. So before, when I first started running track, I ran for the high school. I started running for the high school at 12 years old. And those coaches, they were okay, but they didn't quite have the kind of knowledge that I needed until I got to uh, start running club is when I really started to get that that feel for um, the coaching style that I personally liked. And one of my coaches, one of my first club coaches, Coach Clarence Richardson, call him Coach Rich, he um, was primarily a youth coach. And by the time I came to him, I was already 18 plus. And he started me from the beginning. Um, I had been out of the sport for a couple of years and he said, okay, if you want to want me to coach you, you're going to have to start from the beginning with the little kids. And I'm like, what? These are like, these are nine-year-olds. And he said, he was like, no, if you want to do this, you're going to have to start from the beginning. And so he forced me to start from square one again. And that really helped me because it further developed uh, the love that I had over time. It renewed the love that I had for the sport. And uh, among other things, it, it taught me, he taught me to really learn how to embrace the pain and discomfort and learn from that. You know, it's, it's one of those things, track and field is a, it, 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 the practices are very uncomfortable. They're not fun sometimes they're fun, but most of the time they're not, you know, especially when you're doing conditioning and what have you. So um, he he taught me to embrace those things, learn from them and control your urge to want to quit. And that helped me to become a more accomplished athlete. So by the time he set those building blocks, so by the time I went to uh, a more seasoned coach that could get me into bigger races, I was prepared. yeah sounds great <laughs> sounds like a coach I'd like to have um David I think you're next or do we go Jacob next how about you Chris I'll take Let's it hear from you you know in uh college uh Jim Brock was uh pretty tough as Damon alluded to I was this uh skinny kid from Oxnard California I came 
to Arizona State uh, on a full scholarship. I was pretty arrogant. I, I believe at that time that uh, the college needed me more than I needed my team. And, you know, and um, definitely they feel like I needed to grow up. Jim Brock was that coach. You know, he, he yelled at me a lot, kicked me out of practice a lot. Uh, there were a few times where I would show up and I didn't even make it out on the field, to be honest. He just said, hey, I, I just don't want you here. Uh, and That's it was true. a humbling experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a hum- it was a it, it was a humbling experience, you know. And um, I still stayed arrogant. I stayed true to my guns and who I was. That's all I had known as a kid. Um, to a certain extent, it's what got me to Arizona State. Yet, you know, like having this arrogance and this confidence about myself. Yet, uh, I hadn't learned how to be a team player. I hadn't learned that other people actually care about you, you know. And uh, I've never told the story to anybody. Uh, as Coach Brock was dying, it was my junior year. I had just been drafted by the San Francisco Giants uh, late in the first round. Uh, we were at the College World Series. Damon was there. Uh, Jim Brock called me into his room, and uh, he sat in this corner. It was dark. It's, it's like a movie scene in my mind. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, he calls me in there, and, and uh, at the time, I walked in with so much anger. You know, like I, I just kind of resented this person, you know, the way he had treated me. Um but he said a few words, you know, and at that moment, um, after he said that, you know, throughout his coaching career, that he hadn't seen somebody grow up as much as I did, that he hadn't seen somebody, you know, uh, come as far is his words as he had seen me come. Um, and then at that moment, you realize like everything that he had done for me, you know, was a life lesson. Uh, and I remember I broke down crying, um, because I realized at that moment that he actually cared about me. And I just didn't see that. I was so angry at this person and, you know, of all the things that uh, he had done for me. But I also had to reflect back at how much I had grown up because of him, uh, how my character had changed, how I, how I viewed the team differently. Um, and I remember, you know, just hugging him, crying. Uh, I actually felt bad the way that I was feeling walking into that room told him that I loved him. And uh, three days later, he passed away. So uh, it was one of those stories where somebody in my life, was, I, and I didn't know it at the time, creating this huge wake in me, this positive wave um, that has shaped me to who I am now, you know, and um, probably could have been that arrogant, cocky kid still. And, uh, but I, I think I learned humility uh, through him. Um, and uh, proud to say that uh, he has been a huge, and had, had been a huge uh, person who has molded me, not only in my coaching career, but as, as a character of my personality. Awesome, Chris. Sounds, yeah, sounds pretty impactful. Yeah. <laughs> so my turn, right, Courtney? I think it's your turn. Thank you. So my real quick Jim, Jim Brock story was, the, the, well, I have several of them, but um, one I'll share here is my last conversation with Coach Brock was, I, in the uh, game one of the college world series, I hit a ball to left center field and anybody that knows me knows that I'm not a, well, might be surprised, but not a fat, not a fast runner. And I couldn't tell as the left center fielder went back, if he caught the ball or if it went over the fence, I just saw that outfielder, Jacob, you probably remember Bruce Thompson um, yeah. from Miami and he, and he, and he fell down and his glove fell off. And so I didn't see the ball. So I, I actually ran as fast as I could around the bases because I figured, you know, not seeing it went over the fence. And, and so I got home, I had a home run in the college world series. And, uh, and after, after the game, coach Bross signaled me over and he loved to, to pick on me. Um, uh, and he kind of signaled me over and I, I, I bent down and, and I said, yes, coach Brock. And he said, that was the ugliest friggin' home run trot I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah. maybe a different wording and then he just sat there looked at me smiled and and that was it <laughs> you know so just it, it was uh, something i always remember anyways so uh that question courtney asked one great story or one thing that i got from a great coach and i want to say like casey said i agree you can learn as much or more from poor coaches of what not to do as you can learn what to do now, um, but one great experience I had was how to, was moonshot thinking, moonshot thinking is uh, Andy Lopez was the head coach of Pepperdine 
which is a small school out of, you know, out of uh, Malibu, California, and never, never even came close to, to winning the College World Series. And so he had this great recruiting class the year before me. And then um, I came in with this, this class. And from day one, he said, we're going to win the College World Series. We're going to win the College Series. And there's probably, you know, me and maybe some of the other ones who said, well, I don't know who's that, how's that going to happen against these massive schools like Oklahoma or um, Arizona State at the time, Wichita State, whatever it was. But that was his purpose and his drive. And he said, if we work together as a team, you know, not individuals, but as a team, we can accomplish anything. And uh, he truly believed it. It was a, it was a moonshot goal. And, you know, unfortunately for me, I got hurt and left. But the very next year, they won the College World Series. And, and it was a, uh, something that it was amazing, you know, that a, a coach had the vision and the purpose and, and the belief in, in his team to be able to get to what they've done. And that was something that I will always, uh, always remember. So. That's an excellent story. Um, I'm sorry that you missed that though, David. <laughs> what a bummer. Um, but thank you for that. So I've actually gotten a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, I've got a couple of questions that we still wanted to hit on. Um, the next one is actually directly for Casey. Uh, so Casey, the question is, um, can you talk about identity crisis when, when as an athlete, and this is a, kind of in line with, I think, a, a question previously from Rachel, when you leave this world of athleticism, you leave this world of just such rigid goals, you have such specific objectives, and you move over into the world of business, how do you justify those changes? How do you handle that, that identity shift? And what advice would you give to those that are coming out of, you know, collegiate athletics or professional athletics and having to make that move, that lateral move into an entirely new space? I mean, it's a great question. I, I think, first of all, it's a reroute. So they're universal. Know that. Know that you're not alone, even though it might feel like an isolating experience and that you're the only person in the world going through it. Um, call it what it is, which is an identity crisis. You're losing a part of you to who you were before. Um, and then also acknowledge that whatever you do moving forward, like there are so many countless transferable skills that you won't even know until you're in the role and you're like, oh, I'm disciplined and I'm not complaining, but other people are. And you don't even know that, that these traits are within you until you're surrounded by people who perhaps didn't have the same background. And it's not to say that athletics is the end all be all. I think you can learn a lot of different lessons through a lot of different experiences. But um, for me, I remember I, I pursued a career professionally that somewhat pertained to, to my athletic pursuits and personality that just, you know, I developed at that point um, being gritty uh, bouncing back. Those are part of my brand. They always have been. Um, so I chose a job in sales and figured, Hey, I'd try on, try on this personality and see if I liked it. Um, and then once I was there, I realized I was one of probably a select five people that were putting in the extra work and being extra, extra diligent and ensuring that my emails didn't have typos, you know, like things that you don't even realize you've that have contributed to who you are, they will continue to. Your values don't necessarily shift. It's just your pursuit and who you perceive yourself to be. But I think each of us to our core, we're the same people throughout our lives. We just try on, you know, personalities like clothes and some don't fit. And then we, we discard them and we realize, hey, that's not, that's not our, that's not where we should be. Um, so I guess it's a mix of knowing that you have those traits, but also pursuing something that has, gives you the, the ability to utilize some of those more transferable skills. That would be my advice. That's good advice. I, I think that, you know, focusing on those universal traits that come from it and figuring out how to leverage those. And I think you're right, Casey, I think people need to be kind to themselves. They might have to try on a few things before they realize what fits and that's okay. You know, yep. There's no shame in having to try a couple of things out first before being happy. Um, so uh, the next question that I'm going to shift to is actually for Jacob. And um, then after Jacob, I'm going to have a question that came from a participant for everyone. But Jacob, I want to start with you. Um, this question is specific about uh, the concept of management versus leadership and kind of what the difference is. And obviously, um, there's there's a lot of focus on that in the professional world. I mean, us at, in, in, you know, at Learn It, we're seeing more requests for 
building strong leaders rather than good managers. Um, so I'm curious your take and how you sit in this world of kind of a balance of a little professional space, but athleticism, you know, professional athletes, you know, what is your take on the variation and what makes a good manager, but what makes a great leader? No, I love the question. And, um, you know, I've contemplated this, you know, as in sports and in business, you know, I, you know, my, myself owning a small business. Um, and I think that we, we sometimes confuse managers as leaders, right? Because they have the title or they have the name on the door. Um, and in reality, if they're managers, we would hope that they're great leaders, but that is not always the case. Um, so, you know, the way I see it is managers are people that uh, record the information of what's happening over the people around them. Truth be told, I, I think that you want to be a leader, you know, um, you want to inspire people, you want to motivate people, and you don't have to have that title to be a leader, you know, and the way I see it in sports and in baseball is sometimes we have players that aren't the best players, they aren't you know, the ones that are contributing to, a, to our team offensively. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, they might be detrimental <laughs> offensively, but they bring energy, they bring leadership, they motivate the people around them. You know, they create this culture in the team that's about winning. And you instinctively want to be around these people. So my point to this is like, you know, I think we should all be interested in learning these leadership skills. Um, how can I impact and lead, uh, even though I might not have the title or, or not have, be the CEO? Uh, we're fortunate that Damon, as I've known him, you know, he's a leader, he's a manager, he covers that very well. Uh, Damon, that was a little extra there for you, buddy. Uh, but uh, um, you, my, point is, my, my point is, you know, you know, this is something that we can go out there and, and, and learn, the skills of leadership are out there. So how do you separate yourself in the business world is by, you know, bring, attracting people with your energy and your charisma. Uh, you can do that. You can learn these things. And um, whether it's classes or, or it's instinctual, um, it's out there. So I, I mean, hoping that some of you guys can expand on this, because this is really something that for me, as a coach, uh, there are tons of people that want my job, um, that have done it at the big league level, just as I have. Uh, I think that what separates me is one, my, my leadership skills, the energy that I like to think I believe that I bring to the team uh, and my hard work. You know, I, I, those are foundations and pillars of who I am. Um, and I think that anybody can actually do that. So if you can motivate yourself to be and get yourself those skills that are required, and especially now with COVID, right? Like, you know, people are a little bit strange after a, a 2020 year where, you know, everybody's been secluded and, and they don't know how to talk to people anymore. How do you separate yourself in this business world? And, and I think you can do that through leadership skills. Definitely in agreement. Valetta, do you have something you want to contribute to that? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and if I may add to that, uh, very well said. Um, what I would also say is, yeah, just like, um, just like Mr. Cruz said, there is a huge difference between management and leadership. And I think management is somebody gives you a list of duties and you just assign duties to the people that are beneath you. And leadership is more of you take that list and you say, who in my group that I've kind of paid attention to, I've been watching them, I've been helping them, who would be best suited for these tasks and who would I be able to kind of build up to that next level? So it's a little bit different. I think leadership is a lot more hands-on than management. And I think um, people get that confused because you don't have to be, I mean, management, being a boss doesn't mean that you're a leader. It just means that you are the person who, if something goes wrong, you are responsible. <laughs> and that that's a whole different, you know, it's a, it's a slightly different, different ball game, but I think leadership is a more valuable trait because just as um, that just is what was said earlier, those people are harder to come by because they can get things out of people and they can inspire people to do things rather than, hey, do this or you're fired. There's two different, two different types of motivation. So 
I think that's a great point. I think it ties in beautifully, you know, leaders create a vision, right? And they get everyone on board with that vision. Like Damon, mm-hmm. the coach that said, we're going to win that college championship. It was a vision. Yeah. He, he created that and that's, that's leadership. So um, thank you guys for that. I, I do want to switch over to some questions that have been coming in. I'm going to go back to one from Lindsay. Um, uh, that, that, and then I'll move on to, I think Spencer had one and Peter. So we'll try and get to all of yours with the 12 minutes we have left together. Um, so the one from Lindsay from our team for the panel, no one specifically, I think all of you can contribute to this, this question uh, as athletes, you know, what, how do you keep appreciating the process or journey? even when you're not making the the moves and the needle isn't moving the way you want it to, you're not seeing the progress. You're not seeing those achievements the way you think you would. And you just keep striving, you know, Damon, like you were talking about when, when you're, when you're out, when you're practicing hitting and, and you're not seeing the movement, how do you keep the appreciation for the journey and the process? And this applies to both, obviously your, your careers in athletics, but also professionally, you know, when, when you're working on a project or you're working towards a goal, if you're in sales, how do you make sure that you can focus that the journey will get you there and trust that it will the way you did in sports? Does anyone want to start? Yeah, I can start, Courtney. Um, A lot for me, and this is more in the professional context, I think, well, actually, no, I take that back. There's some crossover. My perspective has always been, all right, if this gets me one inch closer to where I ultimately want to be, then that's a win. It's easier said than done, obviously. For example, if you're in the gym working out every day and you're not seeing results and it's so frustrating, but I think that knowledge that even just you're getting, you're getting one step closer is if that can fuel you, then let it, and let it, let it burn as your fire. Because that, I think, I think athletes have that a lot. It's almost like this, this vision that nobody else can see. And maybe you're the crazy one that can see it. Um, but we have to, we have to find it and, and create it if it doesn't exist. And yeah, I don't know. I, I think that that's kind of all I have on that topic, at least I'm sure more will come up as people speak, but that one inch closer, even if it's a thankless job that you don't necessarily even, maybe it's a different industry that you don't, you want to work in. I realized in my first sales job that I didn't want to be in sales, but I knew I had to get out of the sales and how, how was I going to get out of the job that I was in? It was going to be being very, very successful. So that extra hour that I put in that is that extra inch getting closer and closer to my ultimate goal of getting out of that position. Um, so that would be, that would be my two cents. Try to try to, if, even if you don't see the, you know, the finish line, pretend that it's there, know that right. you're getting a little bit closer because it feels right. And you know that you're doing the right things like consciously, that would be my, my two cents. I think you should. Uh, I think that's great. Casey and we, like many steps along the way. To me, I, I think a lot of it has to deal with um, getting back to the fundamentals mm. and, 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 and working through the fundamentals. You look at um, all of us as athletes, you know, in baseball, for instance, you have spring training, you know, we, we do, you, do the, you do the fundamentals. And, and the same thing goes with work, whether you're in, whether you're in sales and you need a role playing around cold calls or what you need to do practice classes. You know, I, I just think that it's important. The, the process is important and having faith and confidence that um, doing the fundamentals correctly will, will move you forward. So don't forget the fundamentals. That's my two cents. Fundamentals. Uh, Valetta or Jacob, anything you guys want to piggyback on that or, or uh, anything you want to add? Um, I have something to add. Jacob, did you want to? No, no, go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, thank you. So um, what Damon said was was so key, you know, the fundamentals is what my coach, um, my first club coach was basically teaching me, you're going to get out here and you're going to start from the beginning, you're going to learn the fundamentals, I know that you think that you're all of that and this and that, but you need to start from the beginning every year because you're always starting from zero, no matter how, no matter how successful you were the year before, now it's a new year, you're starting all over, you're starting from zero, but when you start from zero, you start with, a, you start smarter than you were last year, more accomplished, more confident, because you have, you went through the journey the year before. So I think one of the great things about athletes, and this is why I think companies love hiring athletes, because we're not afraid to fail. You know, you just, you're not scared to do it, because if you're going to get to a level 
uh, past college and beyond, you have to get comfortable with that. You have to get comfortable with um, failure and looking and ha- failing publicly. You know, that's something that people are not that they have a hard time being comfortable with. But you, but what one thing athletes understand is you can't get good without that. Valid point, Letta. Um, well, I, I'm because we are at that seven minute mark, and there are a couple of questions I want to make sure we squeeze in here. I'm going to go ahead and jump to these. Um, so, from Spencer, he had a question about if you guys had any, if whenever one or two of you want to answer this, uh, any stories or experiences that you had to implement feedback from a coach. So, put something into practice that they had they had worked with you on, um, and you reached a point of failure. And how did you handle that? Maybe if you were, I, I'm assuming Spencer or the intention here was if you were putting everything into play, you were still doing the things that you were being provided um, in terms of coaching and it just, it failed um, and how you handled that failure. Correct. Okay. Good. Spencer. Good. Anyone want to uh, try and tackle that one? It's never fun to talk about failure, but I think it's come up at least four times that it's just part of the process. I'll tackle it. You know, um, it's a great question. And like Damon has said, you know, baseball is full of, of failure um, and you have to overcome it. I'll give you a personal story. And I think he asked me something personal. Like I, I remember, you know, being on deck and there's 50,000 people and I'm pinch hitting and it's the ninth inning and you're facing the closer and the game's on the line uh, and your heartbeat is just racing, right? Like you're on deck, the lights are on you. And you're the guy, you're up next, uh, and the game's going to be on the line. Uh, and so I remember asking myself, why are you so nervous? You know, why are you, uh, do you feel this um, energy that is not positive? You know, like, and I remember I told myself at that moment, I said, hey, if you choose not to be here, you can put your bat down and walk away. Nobody forces you to be here uh, and, and, and struggle through this, you know? So I turned that negative into a challenge within myself and then like I felt like this pressure just released right you know just like I said okay I'm ready for this at bat um and I used that throughout my 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 career as a player and as a coach you know this this moment in my in my uh, baseball career reflects so many times as a coach to these players because I see that they're young and they're walking up to the plate and they're nervous and I say hey man like hold on a second you've earned this moment you've earned this pressure you know um so how do you turn that into a positive and then mm. like that it's, uh, that to me has you know been a really big coaching moment uh that i've used and where players have come back to me and said hey you know i really appreciated that i needed that at that moment um but i had to go through it you know i had to struggle i had to fail and i figured out a way to come out on top uh and turn that negative into a positive that, that story is beautiful. On, in addition to segue to one of our last questions we had from a gentleman named Peter. Peter, you had actually a couple of questions. One I think we addressed um, earlier from Lindsay's question, but um, is there a specific experience or accomplishment that you try to recall as reinforcement or encouragement? So something that happened to you in your athletic career that you use in this, in your current day job, I, I, Jacob, I think that's an, a, a beautiful story. Um, so, you know, I'd love to be able to ask Letta, Casey, Damon, you know, what experience that you have that you call upon that you remember, even if it's organic, maybe it's not intentional. It just pops into your head. Like, well, I did that. I can certainly handle this call. I can certainly handle this meeting. Um, if, if nothing, uh, then, then just know that you're, you're braver than, than you think. So anyone want to <laughs> take a stab at that? I will, I, I'll go, I'll go first. So, cause one just popped into my head. There are several, but so Anybody who knows something about track and field is they know that it's a very individualistic sport, but it's also there are times where it's a team sport because you're getting points as a team. And the best, my favorite part personally are the relays. I love being on relays because you have like your your sisters or your brothers with you and we all have to work together to win this relay. So everybody has to be on their game. So. Um, this past season, we went to nationals and uh, I ran on the four by four and we were kind of going back and forth of who's going to be on 
the the leg. So I'm like, or being on the team. So there was one young lady, I'm going to try to be brief, but there was one young lady, we kind of went back and forth about whether she would be on. And so they finally got the, the, the roster set. And then I, I ran third. So third is, is kind of the safety leg. You just hold it, you know, whatever they got, you hold it. If you catch somebody great, but just don't get past, don't get walked down, you know, as they say. So um, I get the baton. And before I got the baton, I was super nervous. I was like, okay, this is like probably my last year running collegiately. And I want this all American so bad. I really want it. And I was nervous and I was, and then, you know, uh, Jacob made a great point. I don't know a single athlete that does not talk to themselves, you know, at some point. So (laughs) it's not, uh, a crazy thing at all but everyone does it you you need to because you got to talk yourself down it's like okay calm down you've been working hard they're gonna be fine you're gonna be fine you know so I just I was calm I I watch on third leg you can kind of see how the race is unfolding too so I'm kind of watching I said okay we're in good position I just got to take the thing and go just don't drop it you know so I uh, dropped the baton that's that's what I mean just don't drop the baton just keep going. So I took it and I mean, I just took off and I just held that thing uh, all the way around and we got, we got that all American medal and it was just, it was a beautiful experience. I, I cried, you know, it was just, you know, we worked so hard and I was a coach and I was a player and I was in school. So it was a very sweet um, uh, memory for me for my last year of collegiate competition. Good memory. That, yeah. That's something I'd pull on too. Uh, well, we've got a minute left. Damon or Casey, what if you want to share that special moment that, that you just remember and you draw upon? Who wants to take it? Casey. <laughs> I was going to, I was going to nominate Damon. So um, <laughs> mine's, <laughs> mine's more general, um, but I'll tell you it's, it's wildly applicable to my circumstance. It, so you know, I, I, as athletes, we have, sometimes we have weightlifting at 5 45 AM. Mm-hmm. We get up, we do it. We don't think about it. It's yeah. actually, I, I personally loved weightlifting. Um, believe it or not, you can, can't really tell because of my skinny fat body now, but, um, <laughs> I love that stuff. So I, I remember I started radiation a couple months ago and I went for 33 days, which is excruciatingly long. My appointments were at 6 AM so that we could beat traffic. So I'm waking up once again at 5 15 to go from Midtown to Harlem. And I, for me, I, it was giving me flashbacks of waking up at weightlifting. You just do what you do. You don't complain. And um, yeah, that's my general. I don't have one one event necessarily. But but for me, that was huge. And just like getting through it and there being excruciating pain. But you know what? It was painful during max out lift days anyway. So that was I likened that to, to the experience of getting through, you know, almost a month of radiation and getting up, getting my butt up early. And getting there at the right time too, like that was important, and that's diligence that only my athletic career was able to teach me. I mean, Casey, I don't think uh, Damon's going to be able to top that story. No, I don't think so. I was going <laughs> to say, I bet he is. I'm glad I uh, went first. I, I was going to say, uh, Casey put her podcast in the. Uh, you should all check out her podcast. I listened to an episode this morning, and uh, there's great uh, leadership stuff in there. Um, just mindset things in there for you. So I, I just want to make sure that um, everybody's aware of that. I'm sure Absolutely. we'll put it in offsite too, but yeah. Yeah. And to double down on that, Damon. So as we're wrapping up here, um, Carly is going to be putting links in the chat to everyone's social. So how to stay in touch. Um, uh, we've got them right there. We've got some Twitter, LinkedIn accounts. Um, feel free to grab those. If you don't feel like screenshotting or grabbing them now, they will be sent in a follow-up email as well as further ideas on how to stay in touch with offsite, future events. Um, we hope you guys come back. If there was some burning question you didn't get answered, feel free to put it on offsite. We'll get it answered for you. Um, I just want to say a big shout out. Thank you to all the panelists for being here. Um, I I think we all picked up something. Uh, I certainly did. So uh, thank you, Damon, Jacob, Valletta, and Casey. This was an awesome, awesome event. And thank you to all the participants who joined us and the folks on YouTube too, who we we don't see here in Zoom. Um, And unless there's anything else, uh, I think uh, everyone can go enjoy their Friday and go try to remember a story from their athletic past and put it into play with work. I know I'm going to go start thinking. I'm going to go look at old volleyball photos now.
Thank you, awesome. Courtney. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Yes, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you guys so much. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.